So thank you, Dan uh, and Hannah, for this invitation. Um, I'm delighted to be taking part in this series and uh, being a part of the first conversation as part of this series with Anna and Maha. Um, I, uh, I, I thought I would kind of try to give us a little bit of framework to work with here um, before we sort of delve into a, a closer look at the work of Pei Fata. Um, so one thing to say here is that while this series essentially focuses on the rise of publishing in the Arab world since the 1960s, for me as someone who um, essentially works on publishing during the long 19th century, uh, I thought it would be you know, important for me at least to open today's session with a few thoughts on um, the shifting views about publishing and recent scholarship on um, this particular history in the Middle East. And I'm hoping that these few points will help us understand the importance of Kefata's work in sort of upending many of our conceptions about publishing practices, their medium, and their afterlife. So when we think of publishing, we're prone to focus on the idea that the practice is technologically and logocentric. So what I mean by this is we tend to underscore the, the methods, the modes of production, the technological modes of production, and really emphasize uh, the role of modernity and industrialization in the propagation of textual production and dissemination uh, within the public sphere. At the same time, publishing for a lot of us still evokes a very logocentric understanding of knowledge production and circulation. Um, an idea that, you know, one that is done via, particularly by a text, mostly. And these views have um, really formed the backbone of discussions on publishing in the modern uh, public sphere. And of course, their centrality to issues of national identity. And here I'm, I'm, you know, evoking, of course, probably most people already know this, but I'm thinking of Benedict Anderson's views about print capitalism or the mass production of secular texts that engage a public readership and the forces of com a commercialized market uh, fostered the emergence of national consciousness and views of a collective identity in, in Europe. Additionally, of course, we have Jürgen Habermas's argument that the consolidation of print commerce led to the formation of a bourgeois public sphere in which the public organized itself as the bearer of public opinion through rational critique via printed books and newspapers. But in the context of the Arab world in particular, and we can say maybe even in the non-West more broadly, there have been various scholars who've called for alternate readings of local notions of publishing and even of the public. For instance, um, the historian Dennis Shazdi, who mostly works on the 18th century, um, Damascus specifically in the Ottoman context, has argued that the notion of publishing shouldn't be limited to print. Rather, one can say that any handwritten or printed text meant to be read in the public domain can be considered a public text, which would extend the notion of publications to numerous media, but also you know, to inscriptions on buildings. So from anything from adver advertisements to newspapers to uh, building inscriptions. And for me, this really recalls Pei Fata's idea of making public and public making as a commitment that is nuanced in its complexity and its unfixity, and one that cannot be limited to the realm of print. At the same time, we have some historians who have challenged the logocentrism of the publishing industry. So probably the one who comes to mind it right now is most recently the work of Ziad Fahmi. Um, Fahmi has a new book out, uh, but his older book also dealt with this topic. And basically he calls for a critical consideration of performance, orality, and sound, and not just text when it comes to the question of publishing and readership. Of course, another important aspect to examine is visuality, which is one that I personally um, focus on in my own work on 19th century publishing practices, mostly in Beirut, but now I've kind of been extending uh, my purview to Cairo and to Egypt. Um, in my first book, I considered the overlaps between scribal and print conventions as early articulations of Arab modernity in Beirut. And I'm currently working on a study that considers the rise of the printed image and its importance to visual and not just textual literacy at this time. 
But visuality has also been recently explored by other scholars, such as Dana Mastri, who I believe is on this call, and will be participating in an upcoming installment of the series. Um, in her cosmopolitan radicalism, Mastri focuses on the important role that Beirut's publishing industry in the long 1960s played in its intersections with artistic practice and the growing political commitment and radicalism of the arts and of artists and designers in the face of the events of 1967. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a sort of a bookend uh, before we get started with uh, looking closely at the work of Kei Fata and, uh, and, uh, and Maha's work, um, and to really be rethinking the very notion of what publishing means and its audience um, in, in the context, not just in the, the context of Kei Fata's work, but also it's something to keep in mind that it has been and currently is being considered in relationship to publishing in the pre-1960s. Um, so with that, I hand, I hand this over to, um, to the both of them. Thank you, Hala, and uh, thank you, Hannah and Daniel, for this great invitation. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us uh, today. Uh, maybe I'll start by uh, introducing myself and Ella herself, and then we introduce Kaipata briefly. Uh, so, yeah, Daniel already introduced us, but we'll just, uh, I'll say um, I'm a originally a visual artist uh, from Cairo. Uh, that's my entry into the arts. Uh, I studied previously uh, economics and uh, Middle Eastern history uh, and always had an interest in photography running along, but then I moved uh, more and more into, uh, into the arts. And, um, uh, and my practice has moved on from like different mediums, from uh, photography to film to uh, publishing as an artistic practice, uh, and I'm based in Cairo. Um, uh, maybe I'll pass on to Ale. Um, thank you very much for having us, and uh, we're really excited for this series. Um, uh, I'm a visual artist too, uh, and uh, I am Maha and I, we met in Amman, uh, when she came to research uh, for one of the shows she was curating, Meeting Points, or co-curating, but then we met again in Sharjah Meeting Point, me, uh, March Meeting, sorry, and then we met again in shows that we were invited to and we kept meeting. And as we kept meeting, we started uh, yani our friendship, but also this collaboration projects. Um, um, so my work is uh, mostly informed by research and the medium that I work with is, in, is also informed by the outcomes of, of the research or the necessities or the needs of the research that I've done. Uh, I researched uh, a lot um, industrial projects in Egypt and industrial pro promises as part of uh, the Pan-Arab also um, project and uh, I also researched uh, the um, political shifts and the way, uh, as they affect uh, polit uh, architectural projects and urban plans in, in Iraq and uh, or in particularly in Baghdad and the way these architectural projects are were exported to the region and kind of uh, created their own you know uh, regimes uh, yeah in the places where I live and work and I've also worked um, with uh, like on so concepts of militarism and on um, uh, performance, perform like the performative uh, in in political documents, or how do we read the perform performativity in political documents or photographic documents? So um, yeah, this is it for now. And maybe okay. Mahal produces uh, introduce. <laughs> um, so when we started thinking together, uh, so uh, like Ella said, uh, uh, we met through these different exhibitions. We both were uh, artists, but also had uh, different roles in, in uh, art institutions in our cities, uh, Ella and Amman and me in Cairo. And also uh, like a beginning of a curatorial uh, practice. And uh, we felt uh, as practitioners this, uh, uh, the difficulty of, uh, of accessing artistic work outside of the finished exhibition. So as a curator, for example, how to know uh, 
uh, of, uh, of artists, uh, how to reach uh, those artists, how to see their latest works. Uh, there, it's always kind of a, a, a real um, effort to, to find who's working on what, and it's, uh, it's very informal. So we started thinking of, uh, we had different ideas of creating platforms for uh, sharing uh, artistic work. Uh, from like platforms for like sharing films uh, of independent uh, filmmakers and things like that. But uh, what took off was uh, this, this project, uh, like or what we actually <laughs> started working on was, uh, was Kaifate. And the idea came in around uh, 2012. We published our first uh, book in 2013. And uh, the thought was that we would like uh, to produce a series of uh, how-to books uh, or books that take the format of how-tos, uh, use it as a, as a kind of familiar, um, a familiar uh, vehicle, like a, a, a form that is uh, popular and that is uh, recognizable, but to pass through it uh, more experimental writing. Uh, and the authors we invited uh, came from both art and non-art backgrounds. And this was uh, uh, for us uh, part of the idea. So the, the idea for this series uh, was to uh, kind of try to, to um, remove a little bit this, this dividing line between uh, art producers and receivers, uh, audiences and non-art uh, producers and audiences, because we felt there are like some very um, interesting writing or art production, not necessarily just uh, writing, uh, that is only known in, in for gallery goers, you know, or these, these circles and vice versa. There are very interesting writers who are published in more uh, uh, public um, or uh, more mainstream uh, publishing platforms who are not necessarily engaged in the more uh, specialized um, discussions or circles. So uh, also coming from the arts, we were a little bit also, um, uh, we're, like, we were not uh, happy with the, this confinement or this exclusivity of art spaces and wanted to uh, get out of this a little bit. So. Uh, this was the idea to bring uh, authors from either side of the art and non-art into one series that is uh, takes on a popular format in terms of size and uh, price and uh, and where it is placed. So we placed in regular bookstores and things like that. So methods of printing and and final like production and pricing and all of these things. Um, what you see uh, is the cover of our first book. Um, uh, How to Disappear by Haysam Luardeni. And uh, so this book came out in 2013. It's mainly uh, goes through uh, um, kind of uh, auditory, auditory um, uh, exercises or exercises that deal with sound. And through that, uh, it's a, a series of exercises that relate to your subjectivity or your position in relation to a, to a group, to a public, so it's different negotiations uh, with self and with uh, a general public. And it was interesting that this book was uh, extremely popular uh, when it came out. And we always kind of feel like there was, uh, it was a time like 2013, uh, it was a very loud time. So in the region, it was a period of, of uh, like uh, the Arab Spring uh, and it was uh, a period of like uh, re rethinking many things, protesting and and uh, uh, really like noise, <laughs> and and the pressure of being of having a public also um, uh, role or presence. Uh, for example, just being there physically on the square, like things like that. So it was interesting that a book that was actually visiting this idea of looking inwards and uh, attending to your private uh, self uh, had some kind of resonance at that time. And like the title itself, it seems because at the time, what you see now is the is a format, this pocket size format is a format that we adopted a little bit later when we first published this book, it was a little bit bigger. 
the name of the author was not on the cover. Uh, so it was just how to disappear, that's it. And it was interesting to see how it, uh, how it was, uh, became popular. Maybe I'll just go through quickly like the covers of, uh, so you just know the range of publications. Uh, how to imitate the sound of the shore using two hands on the carpet. Uh, was a book uh, by Jevdet Erik, a Turkish uh, uh, visual artist, sound artist. Uh, uh, different, uh, he has different kind of works in different mediums, and it's basically uh, he goes through a process, of also meditative but also uh, practical, very tactile, uh, of how to imitate the sound of the shore, even if you're not next to a sea, just using things that you have, like your hands in a carpet. Uh, the next, um, yeah, you see here images from the inside of uh, the exercises. Then came How to Know What's Really Happening by Francis McKee. Uh, it's a, a, one of our small, smaller books and it's, uh, it's very funny, uh, <laughs> but also philosophical. And again, the title was uh, quite uh, resonant. I can't go into uh, all uh, like the in detail uh, how to mend uh, motherhood as ghost by Imen Mursel, who is uh, uh, one of the currently one of one of the most celebrated uh, uh, women poets in the Arab world. Um, and uh, in this book, she goes through. Um, she starts from an image of her and her mother, like a photograph, the only existing image that she has of her mother uh, and she investigates uh, uh, motherhood uh, through photography and what can be captured what is missing and uh, what is emphasized but it's also it has different kinds of writing in it from the diaristic to the more uh, academic uh, to the more poetic and reflective uh, how to spell the fight by natasha sadr hajjian uh, also kind of focuses, starts from this uh, cat's cradle uh, uh, game that we know from childhood to investigate like uh, uh, different uh, paths of uh, learning uh, and different paradigms of, of education. Uh, next. And these are latest to the, these ones are still not translated. Uh, one is translated into English, but will be published uh, in this coming month, and the second is yet to be uh, translated because of its special uh, poetic language, it needs a kind of a very special translator. So the one on the right is How to Remember Your Dreams by Egyptian uh, writer Amr Ezzet, in which he explores dreams as both uh, the dreams that you have when you're asleep, but also your dreams of what you want to do in life and how it's kind of biographical, so how he moves from one stage to the next, from having more, uh, from a more religious grounded uh, uh, worldview and readings and uh, role in society to more uh, towards another um, end uh, as he moved forward through the revolution and everything to a more secular and, uh, uh, and a completely different set of, uh, of uh, writers who influenced him. And the one on the left is by Hussein Nasruddin, a Lebanese artist and poet. It's called How to See the Palace Columns as if they were uh, palm, palm trees. Uh, and the last uh, book that we just published as an ebook so far, but also will be uh, printed this month, is How to Love a Homeland by Oksana Timufiva in which she uh, investigates uh, different notions of uh, what's a homeland, what's different relationships to land. And uh, uh, she kind of tries to retrieve the concept of, uh, of a connection to a, to a birthplace. She tries to uh, reappropriate it from right-wing uh, discourse to um, uh, to, a, to, a, to a different discourse and um, to kind of just re-emphasize this connection to a land and without it having uh, uh, fascist uh, overtones. <laughs> so this is just a quick uh, uh, like uh, uh, presentation of, of this series, this, this uh, pocket-sized series that we did. 
and it's still ongoing. Uh, but I'll just like to say uh, to to say like we had two more phases in our in our activity as Kaifate, and I'll hand over to Ale. But I'll just say that uh, this is a our first uh, project like phase of Kaifate, which is still ongoing. But then in 2019. Uh, we started um, uh, curating exhibitions that were uh, focused on uh, uh, alternative publishing practices uh, in the region, but also with uh, the resonances uh, uh, that are international. So it's not just uh, the region, but with an emphasis on researching and presenting work from the region. And the third uh, phase, which is also still ongoing, is uh, an interest in publishing itself as a subject. So we started uh, a, a, a second series of books that focus on publishing as a as a medium. Uh, but now I hand over to Ale for the exhibition part. So yes, in 2019 or late 2018, we were invited to curate a show for Beirut Art Center. Um, we, as, um, as independent publishers or as artists who consider publishing as part of their artistic practice, uh, over, like, uh, over the years of trying to publish on our own or through collaborations with institutions, uh, we were going through certain, like, uh, we were going through, of course, the life uh, cycles of, of publishing, of publishers, of other publishers, but also you know, uh, going through obstacles ourselves, changes in law uh, requirements or expectations from from us as uh, as people who are producing publications, and sometimes or maybe often we were, especially at the beginning of the project, we were you know, normally over like we were uh, often overshadowed by the institutional partners that we had when we were producing our books. Books, so we were also interested in what sorts of um, and the types of kinships and uh, also uh, parallel uh, practices uh, of people who were like well, other artists who would be publishing or had published in the past or publishing projects that are struggling or trying to exist and and cross borders and and or or manage to print or to find a way to print whether at printers or at home or and so on and so we used them um, this opportunity to, or this invitation to curate a show to basically put together an, an exhibition on independent publishing. And we were not really sure as we were curating it, uh, what, is, what is it going to look like at the end, but we, were, um, we, we knew what we were looking for. We were looking for projects that could, uh, you know, tell us some, yeah, more information about the life of a publisher, about the promise of publishing, about the F publishing effort. And uh, we ended up producing three shows, in fact, one, in, uh, one at the Beirut Art Center in July uh, 2019 that ran for two months. And the second one was How to Maneuver, uh, Shapeshifting Texts and Other Publishing Tactics, which was at um, a warehouse in Abu Dhabi. And that was uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And with that show, we had a budget to produce a publication. And we also... Uh, we figured or, or um, like we arranged the, the public program uh, budget to produce a symposium uh, on publishing. And the third iteration was in Amman under the title of the same of the first the same title of the first show, How to Reappear Through the Quivering Leaves of Independent Publishing. But in every show that we put together, we had uh, we looked closely at the, the publishing scene in the country. Uh, or in the city, but also in the, in the country, in the region around the, the place where we're showing, and we included around fifty projects or more in every in every show. <clears throat> so uh, some of the so I'm gonna present some of the projects that we uh, or some of the ideas or tactics that we've utilized in these shows. One moment. Uh, so we were looking at uh, shows, uh, we were looking at publishing effort or independent publishers who, uh, or authors who self-publish themselves or self-publishers. And for instance, one of the examples that we were uh, impressed with and kind of, uh, um, yeah, tried to present in the show was the work of, uh, or to highlight the work of Adib Shabab, the, 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 the author of the youth who was a uh, 
uh, who is uh, uh, an Egyptian author, writer who had um, uh, self-published his own books uh, back in the 90s. And this is his uh, like his pen name, and he used utilized uh, several ways of uh, uh, you know marketing. He was very good at marketing his own publications. One moment. So, for instance, here we see uh, him carrying a kite that carries his uh, pen name. So he probably uh, flew in the, in the skies of Cairo. And in other cases, he would, for instance, um, commission a banner in which he writes the name of his latest novel next to his name and sits or make someone sit behind the goal uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a famous or in a very visible uh, um, soccer game. And when um, the, the players are shooting, shooting the ball towards the, the, the goal, he unrolls his banner and then he gets the information, you know, seen on um, or his like the information on his latest publication already advertised, uh, you know, uh, through whatever that is capturing that moment. We have not necessarily in this show looked at the content, particularly we were not necessarily looking or tracing what sort of like what do we like or not like about the content that is being published as much as what sorts of you know uh, visibility these projects could have had uh, and so we could uh, find or know or collect the histories of uh, oral histories or find this article or princess maha knew about him because he had sprayed his uh, some of his uh, banners in front or in front of uh, at the exit of uh, or at the entrance of or near the entrance of the AUC in Cairo but we had not like had access to his publications themselves and this was uh, particularly but something that is, was also interesting because it was it was not only us probably so many people knew about him but not necessarily have read uh, his books so what he managed to do is basically have his uh, like his uh, to advertise his work but not necessarily to know how to circulate it and so this idea of circulation was also very important to us anyways, because we were, um, this was one of the ideas that we wanted to look into when we are looking into this show. And in fact, we tried to commission a research. Um, so we tried to use some of the production budget to commission a research uh, that looks into the feasibility of uh, creating a, uh, a distribution network for independent publishers. But this, uh, such research or such commissions could also change or morph into other projects depending on who have received the, com the commission. But for instance, we also uh, looked at, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, potential possibilities of, you know, bookshops who could also be our, you know, agents in the cities that we are, uh, you know, that we could reach to. And for instance, this is the work of a, of a, of a bookshop in Amman called Bahal Ma or the Place of Water. And uh, the, the owner of the bookshop had inherited these books, like all books, like the library or the bookshop of his father, kind of, and he split it between his brothers. And uh, many of the, the books had already lost their covers. And in this work, he is uh, reproducing, or kind of remaking the covers for these publications. But he has the uh, ability to do so because only because he opens his bookshop 24 hours a day now, not anymore in Corona time. But uh, he would like to open at unusual hours for people to come and, you know, to just have access to publications when they want. So we try to bring an, on board to, to bring within our network such, uh, such like um, uh, efforts or such also possibilities of collaboration or presence. Uh, and look while meanwhile look also at how this uh, this like uh, bookseller was trying also to make uh, uh, to to have his books or the books he offers for sale live longer and in an interesting way we also commissioned artists in the course of this show so for instance we commissioned um, this is the work of Ali Ayal an artist a uh, young artist from Iraq who had lived between Beirut and Baghdad and Baghdad is very well known uh, for its uh, for it being uh, the largest Arab book market. And there's a particular street in Baghdad called Al Mutanabi Street, on which um, you know uh, all sorts of bookstores are available, uh, like offer so, all sorts of publications. And um, Ali traveled to Baghdad from Beirut to uh, look for publications that he had in mind, like you know books that could you know form an image in his own, uh, something in his own imagination. But he also had a mission to look at uh, some papers that his mother had written 
in the past, particularly at, uh, to, يعني, on the last pages of a particular magazine that had offered a place for people to write. But what he found is basically, he didn't find necessarily the books that he had imagined on the Mutanabi street. And he had found that his mother had written, like besides her diaries, exchange, she had exchanged notes with her friends uh, on how the content of some, some of publications or the poems that they read do not fit with, it, with the daily life they live in. And so he carries this, uh, these like all sorts of notes personal and exchange notes and like reproductions of some content plus uh, like the his pick uh, the pickings from his pickings from the Mutanabi street in a blue bag uh, from Baghdad to Beirut and he installs it on the wall in Beirut in the exhibition and uh, there are these drawings that are you know ink drawings that have that are enlarged experiences or enlarged uh, notes from inside these papers this act of moving uh, from one uh, and besides, of course, the personal notes, there are the publications. And in this, um, within the installation, there's an image of him installing the work. But, uh, you know, these paper works are all followed by the mainstream publications. So this act of moving the books uh, or the papers from Iraq to Baghdad, uh, from Baghdad to Beirut, again to Abu Dhabi, and when they could not uh, travel to Amman because they are already installed in Abu Dhabi, um, uh, Ali had to create another work on this. Uh, this act of movement was to Ali uh, an act of publishing itself. And this blue bag in which he carried uh, my papers, he considered it as the traveling publishing house or the publishing house itself. And when he didn't manage to show the same work simultaneously, of course, in Amman and Abu Dhabi, he recreated or he created this um, an image from the drawings into the shape of a publishing house into this miniature model that cannot be accessed except with the size, like unless you're you know, uh, downsized to the size of the memories that you could carry of the content that you have read or authored or um, yeah, managed to retrieve from older times. And the th the also part of what we had produced is basically uh, to try to make you know, the work of uh, other publishers uh, visible not only to the, not necessarily only to the visitors of the exhibition, but also to us as, uh, as publishers, but also as researchers. And here we are showing uh, the work of uh, Simon Fattal, uh, particularly the post Apollo Press, uh, which has, um, as Simon is an artist uh, who had moved to live in, uh, from Beirut to live in the uh, States in, in near California in, in the late seventies. And in around 1982, her partner, Etel Adnan, got a book refused to be published by another publisher. And, she, and so Etel decided to publish this book. And for that, she registered the company, called it the post Apollo Press, created the logo, issued an ISBN, and printed the publication. She thought that she would only print one publication, but then in the same year, she was offered, she, like, she received an expression of interest to translate one of Etel's books into English and went, uh, and she accepted and she offered to publish this book and, and so on. And this started a, a 20 year or more history of, um, or a story of publication, of publishing. Uh, publishing independent uh, experimental uh, poetry and um, a very uh, particular books. What we try to do in this work, for, for instance, is that we, for the first time, we are showing Simon Fattal as a publisher in Beirut, and we have collected all the, as much as we can. I mean, maybe she had published over 76 or something publications. We managed to find 71 or so, and we saw, showed them in a timeline that is intercepted by the documents of, uh, you know, documents that are taken from her own archive, from her post-Apollo archive. And uh, these documents show or illustrate um, how, uh, how yeah, she managed to be or to work on her own during all these years. So basically what we expose here is not the entirety of the work of the practice, but also the details of, of leading it. And uh, so these are like, just like examples of the types of work that we had um, you know, the, the, the directions that we had looked into, but we can always also, of course, mention more projects in the discussion.
Thank you both uh, for this brief intro into the work that you've been doing over the years. Um, I, I thought I'd just uh, kind of, I mean, thinking about your work over the past few weeks, uh, looking at it online and now hearing you talk about your work, I thought um, I, I would just raise a, a few issues that come to mind or ideas that come to mind and really just thinking about um, how Kei Fata's uh, work really challenges our idea of publishing today. And, and then maybe, um, you know, I, I can, we can, I have a few questions, we can discuss those and we can then open up the floor uh, in the last few minutes uh, or maybe the last 20 or so minutes of, of our discussion today. So anybody who has questions, please uh, plug them into the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, so, so one thing that I, I'm really interested in is is sort of this how-to genre or you know the kefata and 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 you explain how there's this sort of interest in this DIY uh, genre as as one that's related to access and availability or popularity. But as you've also shown, this is not uh, a specific didactic commitment. Uh, rather, it's also about sort of unlearning or um, ephemeralizing and diversifying learning. So, um, and I think in one of the conversations that we had on the phone or, or uh, not the phone, but <laughs> we were talking earlier before uh, today um, that, you know, this essentially starts as a sort of a philosophical gesture as an opportunity uh, to be reflective and experimentational um, in considering the, 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 the idea of knowledge and its acquisition. And um, in this way, I, I'm, I've been thinking of whether it would be, um, if one can also read this Kepata series as one that strives not only to upend the sort of DIY or self-help uh, genre of publishing, but also to really you know, shake up the very core of a constructivist notion of knowledge production. Uh, which has dominated academic discourse since, um, you know, since the European Enlightenment. So here I'm specifically referring to this idea that was popularized in the 19th century, um, that, you know, knowledge acquisition um, happens through a sort of an investigation of phenomena uh, beyond the confines of the laboratory using specific tools or equipment. And so if we think about this more broadly, um, it's this idea that anyone can acquire knowledge about anything if one has the tools and the guides to render uh, the previously esoteric, both visible and legible. And I feel that with your series, um, uh, although this sort of how-tos in general, uh, there's this interest in making knowledge legible, um, really what, what knowledge, what this sort of legibility does, it, it hides the discrepancies and the sort of partiality of knowledge production and dissemination and essentially reproduces the fallacies of this notion that something can be universally comprehensible. And so for me, I really, what I think is really important and compelling about Kei series is that it challenges the illusion of legibility and comprehension by upending the very notion that a how-to or that even publishing writ large has a sort of revelatory or universally comprehensible capacity. So this is one point that you know maybe we could talk more about it. Uh, but these are this is one idea. Um, another idea that that pops to mind when looking at your work and thinking about it is um, it brings to mind recent scholarship um, in the realm of book and print studies that calls for the inclusion of ephemera. Um, so you know typically this is often seen as a subordinate, lesser form of transient work. Um, within uh, the broader uh, sort of book uh, narrative or canon, but you know, instead of doing that, what what you what the call is to actually try to ephemeralize books themselves by questioning the indelibility of print, by questioning the stability of print, um, and uh, for me, this is what's really interesting about your work as well is that. Um, it, it problematizes the sort of divide between canonical works or you know, major works and minor works, uh, rather than trying to say minor works 
are also important, right? I mean, so there's this sort of um, challenge that's happening in, in your project that is an important one, not just for Arab publishing, Arabic publishing, but actually for publishing history um, at large. And I really think it's important because it really underscores the unfixity and the mutability of text, um, that they're always changing. And it really challenges the idea that, you know, and something that's persistent, surprisingly persistent today, that when you print a text, you stabilize it. You know, suddenly it's fixed. And that has always been a fallacy. That's always been, you know, not the case. But in your work, you're really completely abandoning this notion of fixity. Um, and making us rethink what publishing is. And in this case, and here I'm, I'm bringing us to my last point, um, you know, one can say that if in the late 19th century, we've understood regional publishing as being one that's focused on specific hubs or centers, both in their physical sense, but also in their standardization of practices, then uh, Kefata's work through focusing on alternative publishing practices, it's actively trying to remind us how translocal these practices really are. So at its essence, you can say that Kefeta strives to decentralize globalized standards and practices such as distribution networks or ISBNs. And I know you have a project, the No ISBN project, maybe we could talk a little bit about that. And we also see sort of the varied formats and forms that publishing can be. Um, a way maybe for publishing to subsist outside of the dominant networks or dominant mediums of production and circulation. So through your publication of a song, uh, for instance, um, that's something that I, that struck me. And at the same time, and, and I don't know if I'm reading too much into this here, but I really feel that these projects are inherently decolonial. You know, but here the colonial or the imperial is not simply the socio or geopolitical, but also the medium specific, the standardized, the centralized systems of the publishing industry. And I'm particularly compelled here to draw a parallel to this notion of shape shifting from your exhibitions. And whenever, when I thought, when I first came across that term in your exhibitions in Beirut, it, it struck me, you know, and, I, and it was something that stuck with me even now when I'm thinking about your work. Um, I, I find it extremely intriguing to think about the shapeshifter. You know, we often encounter the notion of a shapeshifter in science fiction, where uh, an object transforms into another via some sort of external intervention, whether it's an inherent superpower, magic, divine intervention, or some alien abilities. Um, but what's really interesting is, you know, shapeshifting defies the illusion of logic, of coherence of fixity of our reality. And it really unhinges the supposedly stable constructs um, that we, we think of through an external and unfathomable power. So it really destabilizes not just publishing, but our very reality um, and sort of exposes it for what it is. And, um, and it also, you know, uh, in this way, it kind of, pushes away false realities in favor of really spending time with the fleeting and the ephemeral. So in some ways, I'm wondering if we can think about the shapeshifter as sort of a revolutionary, or maybe as a Baudelairean social poet or a social artist, or even as a hacker or a virus that's destabilizing hegemonic publishing and knowledge-making practices. And to that end, I, I mean, and here I can open it up with a question for you. This idea of shape shifting, um, how much does it play into your practice? So, if the shape shifter can and must continuously destabilize a work's construct and categories, how does that happen in the nature of the exhibitions? Um, that you are producing or in the nature of the work that you produce, besides just sort of shape-shifting text, like moving from one medium to the next. I'm talking about sort of how there's also a need, inherent need to, make, to, to not stabilize, right? Things, to, to keep things, keep trying to catch the sort of fleeting ephemeral aspect. Um, so I, I, I have that question for you both. Um, and, you know, there's a few other questions that we can think of, but I'm wondering if uh, there are any thoughts on that. 
Um, maybe I'll just start uh, by saying that, uh, yeah, the shape-shifting part, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's for us something that we felt is, is really inherent to this uh, practice of alternative uh, publishing because it's kind of a way of, of maneuvering obstacles all the time or of uh, trying to redefine uh, a practice uh, because uh, certain forms are not admitted, you know, or certain voices are not admitted or certain biographies are not admitted, you know, so you have to, you have to play around that and you have to um, uh, kind of maneuver in ways uh, that are, are very different from one, from one practitioner to the, to the other. And like you said, sometimes it's, it's uh, text taking different forms. So uh, instead of uh, publishing like a printed book, uh, then came the era of blogs, then came the era of tweets, then can, you know, like different or audio, you know, things like that. Uh, but also uh, there's other kind of uh, uh, ways of, uh, like, like you mentioned the No ISBN project of where uh, uh, producers chose to not be part of a certain system and to uh, hold on to a certain invisibility, right? Uh, so uh, to, to kind of wanting to really step out of this uh, very, uh, this kind of standard uh, global system of circulation and to try to by choice uh, by sometimes by for political reasons sometimes for artistic reasons uh, they chose to uh, operate in smaller circles and less visible circles and uh, that was also something uh, like a line that we followed uh, in the exhibitions but also in the in the research and the publications later uh, like uh, it's not always like the goal to be uh, uh, the most uh, like highly distributed, you know, or highly visible or something. Some some practices choose to do the opposite, mm -hmm. and also uh, with like the medium that you choose, like maybe printing now on paper is something that is uh, maybe uh, less visible uh, than uh, you know uh, posting something uh, online. Um, but maybe I move uh, to Ale if she has uh, an example in mind, but we can alternate now between us as we go. Um, because you spoke about, uh, yeah, I like the readings that you've uh, produced uh, of the work. Um, uh, yes, we were thinking um, that many things, I mean, many things there is, um, for instance, the Trojan horse that is the, our logo um, is pulled by is basically is something about is about something that is hidden that is being passed into some into you know that is brought from one place to another through some sort of a shell um, and it's being pulled by two persons and um, yeah we were this is why we were at the beginning trying to think that we can maybe produce and we're open to the possibility that the author does not want to have his name or her name on the book on the cover or that we collaborate with uh, you know book vendors on the street you know who are you know uh, selling mixed uh, books books you know the original and pirated books we even thought that how do we trick pirates to pirate our books basically to start taking these books and circulate, circulate them uh, by paying for them and just, you know, uh, how do we, like, what sorts of, what would, you know, what would take our book to the pirated market and so on. Because we wanted to reach out to, um, yeah, we wanted, we thought that we wanted to share. Um, so there is the voices that we are interested in hearing, but we also think that it's it's interesting if this if we get also the uh, the general public the public that does not necessarily walk into the exhibition space to read the text that we think that we are also reading and maybe it feeds back somehow and this was really happening in fact uh, because um uh, one way or another uh, part, maybe through our collaborations with some of the writers who had their own fan base who when they liked uh, one book, their 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 favorite writer's book. They bought other books from the series, and it started to grow uh, in that dire in these directions on the readers, but also on us. You know that we have readership from very much outside our own networks. Uh, so these are all um, 
what is happening in the in the pocket uh, size books. But uh, for the research that we have done on uh, uh, in the, the publishing projects, we were thinking that um, uh, yeah, besides everything, besides like how we learn from all of this uh, knowledge and how we could possibly collaborate as we are trying to produce uh, our publications, but also to meet up with other publishers, is that we, as we generate all this information, as we generate or, or accumulate all this knowledge and information, maybe it's best that we are also sharing it with, uh, you know, sharing this information with others, because this would also prepare more uh, chances for, you know, more uh, publishing projects to uh, appear or to be supported or to be followed or to be read or to be pursued and so on. And so this is uh, what started also our um, second series, how to publish. So this is uh, this is the size of the small series that we have, and this is the size of the larger series, which is new. Uh, how to how to maneuver uh, is the first publication, <clears throat> which was enabled and co-published, uh, yeah, through the, the the exhibition and co-published with uh, Warehouse Four Two One, and. Uh, so what happens in these uh, publications, in this how to publish publications, is that we are uh, producing, um, we are commissioning research, or we are reprinting it, or we're asking the writers to give us uh, the right to publish their the text that they might have produced for other contexts, or to look particularly into the issue of publishing. And what also happens, or the nice things that happen throughout the this like these processes, is that some publishing projects were born. Um, in the process, whether through, we don't know if because of how they read the work of Kaifata or they were, or they, or they, but they were like, for instance, there's a very nice publishing group from Amman uh, called Dubbel Ahmad al Wasia, uh, which translates as a wide red bear. Uh, and they published almost six books or more on in in one show, which is the, their inaugural you know uh, launch. Their launch was six uh, publications or so or so in our and it was their their first exhibition was basically in our exhibition Laman. And they keep experimenting with formats and um, and it's very nice to see you know uh, you know echoes and you to see like parallel projects happening uh, around us. Um, and yeah, so these are some of the yeah some of the points that I could relate to yeah, or could expand a little bit for, further on um, to link to your reading. But Maha seems to be to want to say to want to say something. Yeah, just uh, very quickly, uh, I just wanted to say like this again back to the word shape shifting in no, uh, in no, it's a it's a learning kind, it's a way of learning also so it's a way of of evading <laughs> or trying to get over obstacles, but then you learn in the process. And uh, I want, like what I wanted to refer to maybe is our own experience. So, so we are artists who then started to become curators because in response to a certain uh, 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 artistic and cultural realities that uh, where we have to play that role sometimes because um, uh, there aren't many uh, people doing that. Uh, so sometimes you have to kind of curate a show but then sometimes you have to be a publisher right and then you are, are like you feel like you need to be a publisher then that's another uh it is kind of our own shape shifting and through that process we learn things about uh, there there are of course a lot of resonances between the publishing uh, our publishing experience and our experience as artists and curators like again and how to uh, how um, a professional sphere is organized how it's um different types of gatekeeping or of, uh, of uh, forms that are, you know, uh, popular or uh, that are gain visibility and others, if not, like there's a lot of similarities uh, to uh, between curatorial and artistic work and, and publishing. And we learn from that. And then in our process of publishing, we choose to try like uh, the kind of alternative uh, way, which is like not the publishing house, but like the project uh, project format in which we uh, also use our, our background as artists and curators and try to support this publishing project through uh, applying for funds to the art, uh, you know, to the art side of things, not to, uh, we don't even uh, have never accessed, I don't know what funds are available for 
uh, publishing houses. Because, so we kind of tap into our previous experiences uh, and bring that in. And also it provide this uh, space of circulation for, again, uh, authors who, did, who are not part of this, who are not visible to this kind of audience before. So we kind of bring funds from one sphere and place it in another and then take the product and and place it elsewhere. The same we have done, uh, like Ella has mentioned in our shows where uh, production budgets, which usually go for artists to produce artworks, uh, we kind of always try to uh, direct some of these funds to uh, publishing uh, books by others, you know, or like enabling one of the pictures that Ella had showed before is uh, uh, this book that we thought was uh, really interesting and resonated with our experience also with uh, whether to choose to uh, print with an, with an ISBN or not and what, does, what are the political uh, meanings of that or the artistic meanings behind that. And we got to know the work of this uh, Austrian artist, Bernard Cella, and this, uh, this reader he made uh, of different practices uh, uh, and the, like internationally, and we thought uh, that's actually quite uh, that resonates uh, a lot with um, what we've been uh, experiencing and researching and our interest in general. So we decided that this is okay. This is we will. This is a uh, production, you know, <laughs> of the show, and part of the funding will go to uh, translating this book and publishing it. Uh, so it's also there is this fluidity, right? Yeah. that we try to capitalize on and in and maybe this is yeah this is the shape-shifting part like we try to capitalize on the on this fluidity of exiting certain kind of uh very codified ways of working or um uh like spaces that are really uh, separated like so what is in the art space what is in the bookstore what is in uh what is considered an artwork what is considered publishable things mm -hmm. like that and um yeah I'm wondering, I mean, before I, I kind of take questions, we have quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, you know, will you be shape-shifting into archivists as well? I mean, knowing that you kind of became, you were artists and you become curators and you're publishers and then you're like researching based on the experiences that you've had with the exhibitions and, and the projects. How have you been kind of um, sort of you know, cataloging this? Or are you interested in, in kind of, you know, uh, archiving uh, your work? And I guess this can tie into a question that we have from the audience um, in relationship to how you're translating the um, sort of the work uh, a publication, the how-to publications into the digital realm. So, um, I mean, we didn't really talk a lot about the digital realm in relationship to your work. And um, so, I mean, on the one hand, is is the sort of the archival present? Is that a question that, or, or, or some, a construct that you're engaging with, uh, even if intellectually? Um, and then uh, how, how does your work relate to the digital realm? I mean, how are you incorporating the digital realm? Uh, who shall start? Um, you start and then I'll speak about the digital. Mm. Um, like when you say, uh, are, is the archival part of our uh, interests, uh, you mean uh, like uh, archives that are already present or like, um, like well, maybe? Yeah. Mm. Like it, so I'm just kind of just throwing it out there, given that your research grew out of having done the exhibitions. So it's right. not like you thought to research how yeah. publishing is done, right? I mean, you, you, you kind of yeah. kind of responding, right? You're, you're responsive to your, your, it's sort of a generative process. And I'm wondering whether the archival has kind of been included right now or, or given the interest in it um, in relationship to certain exhibitions and practices. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting how we kind of started from the middle, right? From uh, so we started from our own hands-on experience as uh, beginner publishers, right? And as we went along, we started uh, understanding the landscape, right? And like, there's an obstacle here, there's an obstacle there, and all, and then starting to focus on these things and uh, like uh, how to circulate the book, how to issue an, uh, an ISBN number, stuff like like examples and this kind of uh, our research was very focused uh, on kind of these little uh, obstacles here and there and then 
uh, our interest in, in publishing as a field started to grow and which started a more kind of formal uh, research. And, uh, and in terms of archives, so when we started to uh, want to know more about uh, in, uh, alternative publishing practices, uh, um, like if you're not an academic, I guess it's very uh, hard, right? It's, you don't find this, uh, there's not, first there's not a lot that is published and it's not that available. So we start, as we go creating our own kind of archive or our own um, mapping uh, of the history of, uh, of alternative publishing uh, or publishing in general, it's not that publishing in general, like with a capital P is that also, uh, uh, well, uh, well uh, researched, or like maybe it's well researched, but it's not published and available for uh, someone who's not really fo focusing on the subject. But uh, and that's why I say a kind of I think we kind of built it's kind of growing in an organic way or in an eclectic way this mapping. So we kind of come across things not necessarily in a chronological order. So we kind of maybe know of something uh, from the nineties uh, and has like the much more uh, than something that's like the uh, more recent or more. It's just like the, the way things appear in our exhibitions has to do with this organic getting to know a subject either through hands-on experience or through what, what we gradually get to learn through our research. So uh, we are creating kind of our own archives in the sense of, for example, interviews that we started conducting and recording and that uh, um, which become part of our, our research uh, or uh, that become part uh, things that are shared in exhibitions for example in the exhibition so in, in how to reappear there was a recording with um Ibrahim that Ala had done for example about his prison uh, diaries uh, or other other uh, kinds of archives or we commissioned uh, a research into this master movement this movement that is also not not uh, is very little known. This this movement of uh, uh, independent publishing in the 80s and 90s, mostly in Egypt, which also you find very little information about. So again, this you start looking into this kind of trying to look for these magazines, uh, these very ephemeral kind of publications, and you start finding them with some of the people who are working on them and still have copies or you find some uh, someone has a, uploaded a PDF, but not a one issue out of uh, 20, you know, it's, so it's like that. And uh, Ala was, was, was going to talk about the digital. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, I just also wanted to add that uh, in this process, yani, even when we are accessing archives or so for instance, when we met on Allah or when uh, I also visited the archives of, um, of Majalit Majid, uh, like Majid magazine in Abu Dhabi, or the way we tried to also bring uh, the, the, to bring like physic, the real, the original physical documents from Simon Fatal and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, we were also, um, um, we were also, yeah, organizing these public talks uh, that were also co uh, uh, commenting and revisiting or kind of uh, also explaining or sometimes also answering, you know, parts of our questions, but also parts of also or explaining further the, 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 the practices of, the, of, of these histories or these archives that we were interested in. So it was like, you know, so it's just like layers and layers of archives that are being produced or layers and layers of materials that are being somehow with time more accessible. So for the digital, uh, so all these, all these materials, for instance, the symposium that we organized with the warehouse in Abu Dhabi in early 2020, uh, for instance, has uh, is all posted online, uh, is all available online on YouTube. And um, it has, uh, you know, it has gone through, uh, uh, you know, like from publishing to the nation and like, uh, uh, like uh, it was just like narrowing down the, you know, the scope and the number of possibly like the staff or the people who are engaged or involved in the process or in the act of publishing to just one person. So it just like starts from the, you know, this nation uh, wide uh, project uh, until like, you know, I noticed that this printing is publication on a kitchen table in Algiers or something. So, 
what I what we also uh, like the digital has allowed us also to you know in Corona but also in other times to basically have uh, you know our books as e-books where they could also be available and you know um, to people in different geographies right just at the right time uh, just right at, at the time when they are published because when because we are like and we would like to stick to that also to to all, like we're committed to the print you know, to have like our books printed. But this also puts a lot of pressure on us or um, because um, once the book is, it comes out in a, in a certain city, um, so many people in other cities want it, like in other countries. And it just becomes, we need a good distribution uh, network or you need also to be moving around to, or we need to be moving around or friends be, to be moving around to carry them. Or we need to delay, you know, their launch until it's, the books are everywhere and then we launch, which also puts a lot of, you know, um, uh, other questions on like the process and just delays the process, uh, which is not something that we, uh, we try to avoid because of our, you know, because of the flexibilities that independent, being independent publishers offer us. Um, but what I also wanted to say is that uh, these uh, digital notions, I mean, we have produced two of our books as digital books and we're producing the rest now and the rest of the books and we are we have also experimented with audio books and the podcasts that we co-produced with the uh, mmag from the mm mmag foundation in the context of our show there um has been a great site also for experimentation for you know extending uh, the space of the exhibition onto the web where uh, and also in times when you know the physical site was not even uh, accessible for us in Amman because of the closures, the COVID closures. So it was very interesting to not just to interview the people who have taken part in the show, but also to think how we can produce the research that we commissioned and we didn't manage to show because of the show was interrupted to produce it in uh, you know in a podcast, for instance and how to link that to other materials and other archives that we have worked with so that people can understand what sort of content we're talking about when they cannot see what it is. So we basically link Rizo printers in Amman to uh, Sunal Ibrahim's books or an archive, also to a publication by a Palestinian writer on printing in Gaza in the 50s. So we do this all in one podcast, for instance. So this... Um, so this, uh, for, these formats had enabled uh, some experimentation as well that is as interesting. Um, and yeah, and our launches as well, uh, or maybe this is a good moment to speak about the song that we commissioned. So uh, we also thought uh, when, we, when the book was- uh, 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 Can I interrupt you just before yeah. we delve into the song? Uh, there was an earlier question, and, I, and this is like a more of a direct question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Maxine Donat is asking, uh, was the books that you publish uh, in the Kaifata series, are they in Fusha or are they in Naami? Um, and Fusha. how was Fusha. And so how was this decided, she's asking? The authors that we invited, they, they wrote in Fusha. Uh, although there are yeah. like some lines in Iman Mirza's book, How to Mend, that are in Egyptian dialect, but uh, all together uh, the books are in Fusha or translated. Uh, when and they are translated, they are translated into Fusha. Okay. I guess, I mean, to some extent, it's a question of, you know, how do you determine, I mean, how was that determined? Is it just because Fusha is, you know, the, the version of Arabic that publishing occurs in? Uh, or have you considered publishing in dialects? Um, you know, uh, like we do not, we did not take a position for either, you know, it's uh, like the authors, they present, if they presented uh, their manuscripts in, in, uh, in dialect, we would have uh, published them in dialect. And, uh, and if they had wanted the translations in dialect, they would have been made in dialect. So we don't have a, we don't um, uh, have a position for or against, you know, it's the author's uh, choice. Um, so here I'm showing some pages, uh, some like pages from the inner pages of Kaifata. This is, for instance, from um, How to Mend, which was originally authored in Arabic uh, in Fusha. 
And um, uh, Clarissa Burt has a couple questions. Um, the first is, she's saying, uh, I think you, she's, you kind of answered this question, but I'll read it out loud anyways. I believe that some materials um, uh, in uh, for your exhibition Abu Dhabi were collected from the producers of Al Kitab Al Sauda and Al Jaraid from the 80s and 90s in Egypt. In view of that fact, there are so few copies of these materials. Are, are you committing these materials to the digital or another form of archives so that they're accessible? So the materials from your exhibitions, um, are you digitizing them or you are not taking that extra step? Um, so that's just the first question. And then she asks, um, what are the sources of funding? Um, uh, of the funding you distribute in your uh, commissioning. So when you commission authors, um, I think that's what Clarissa meant. Uh, how, how are you, I mean, what kind of funding are you tapping into here or? Um, well, the, you, like the funding you distribute in your commissioning. So yes. um, like, yeah, so I guess this, the funding, so our, the, for, the, for the book series, um, we approach um, um, funding institutions for arts and culture. So our first, uh, our first, but also like uh, several books of ours were uh, funded uh, um, through the uh, Young Arab Theater Fund, which later became uh, Mufradat. They have the small production grant that which we applied to and got for the first uh, book. And then it was more of a collaboration uh, for two later books. Uh, and sometimes, yeah, we get invited to, uh, to curate an exhibition like the How to Reappear and we allocate some of the funding to make a new how to, for example, like the Hassin Nasruddin uh, book, uh, How to See the Columns of the Palace as Palm Trees. So we invited him as an artist. He both had an installation in the show, but we also produced a, a, a kayfata a how to for him. Uh, as for the Kitab al Sauda and al Jarad, uh, so these, these uh, publications that Clarissa refers to are from this master movement, uh, which I referred to, that is kind of uh, uh, not a lot of people know of outside of people who are really interested. And uh, these, uh, uh, we had commissioned research uh, into, into that, and the researcher Ali Al Adawi, who wrote a paper, uh, on the subject, uh, which we published in the How to Maneuver book. Uh, he met with some of the, of the producers of these uh, magazines and uh, borrowed some of their own copies for the show in Abu Dhabi, which he then returned to them. But we have, um, uh, we of course want to digitize them and uh, some of, uh, some of uh, these people we would, uh, we uh, ask them that if we can come back and digitize the rest of the stuff, if, if possible, but also there is also another uh, uh, artist researcher we know who, who uh, has that as a project, like received funding as has this as a project to digitize these uh, magazines uh, from the 80s and 90s. But just to refer, I'll, I'll send you a link, uh, Clarissa, of uh, a website uh, uh, that has uh, some copies, um, it has, for example, uh, Al Kitab Al Sauda, for example. So I'll just place the link and you can uh, view it online. And if I can take a few more of the questions. Um, so there's uh, there's a question uh, that Annika Lenson raised earlier on in relationship to bookstores. And I believe you did address uh, this idea um, in, in your presentation, Anna, but I was uh, wondering if, uh, so you, just to clarify, you're, you don't currently distribute your publications um, to regular bookstores, right? You, you have them mostly. We do have our books in, uh, yani we try to have our books as in whichever bookshop that appear, that accepts to have the books there. Uh, so for instance, we have, uh, we have them in several bookstores in Cairo. They are not necessarily art specialized bookstores, but they are also in art institutions such as the CIC. Same, uh, it's the same case in Beirut where we have our books at uh, the, the little bookshop uh, in uh, off Hamra Street, but also at uh, Snowbird Beirut, but also at Ashkel Alwan and Beirut at Center. Before that, they were also at Darwin. I mean, in maybe they're, 
alternative, right? I mean, I, and I think when you do rely on the Al-Ma'arad uh, al-Kitab al-Arabi, right? So whether it's in... So, the... yeah, when we, uh, so we don't go ourselves except to focal point, which we, uh, which is organized by Shaja at Foundation. We have, uh, they always have our books there as well. We don't travel ourselves to the bookstores, to the book fairs with our books. In fact, they travel with the bookstores that we put them at. I, so for instance, they travel with al Kutub Khan or with Tanmiya bookstore to several Arab uh, book fairs. And they traveled a lot around uh, the US and as well, like, and also the, um, in Europe with the partners that we collaborated with. Uh, so yeah, the book fairs are also a good chance for the books to travel and to arrive uh, to other places, but uh, we're not super dependent on that yet. Maybe the bookstores are, and we just supply the bookstores. And but we know? also have the online stores, so we also have them on Jamalun, and we try to have them also on, you know, as many as possible of online stores. So yeah, it's just we try, and we have them also in Berlin, in London, at the Mosaic Rooms. There's a couple of bookstores in London as well, in the US, in New York, Two Bridges, and so on. So we try to be everywhere, yeah, as much as we can. And Anika's question actually is an interesting question. Did you insist on putting the books in the how-to section uh, in the regular bookstores or not? Is this something no. that you thought of or? Uh... No, we didn't. Uh, no, we didn't ask for particular positioning, but they're normally, they're always like included in a very particular space on their own because of their uh, series. So they have their own like corner in Tanmiya in downtown Cairo or they're very close to the Kishir next to, and like in Kutub Khan, so. And I guess this question of bookstores can take us to readers. Uh, and Rebecca Johnson raises an interesting uh, point here. She says, you know, um, is it only the publisher that can cause a text to shape shift or can a, read, uh, a reader shift the text or object through how they read or use or interpret it? Uh, then, of course, there are likely publishing, editing, writing tactics that can create an opening for the reader to do so. So uh, another way to ask this is, you know, how, how do you engage the reader as well, right, as part of this shape-shifting uh, process? Or is the reader factored into uh, how you conceive of the shape-shifting text? Mm -hmm. So we always think of the readers. That's the first thing we tell anyways. I mean, the whole idea of choosing a how to format is basically because we wanted to simplify as much as possible or to use the, this popular notion, the, the fact that it's a pocket sized book as well. But also in the shows, um, but how do we engage the readers beyond them being readers? I mean- I think uh, uh, maybe uh, from like the, just like the regular formats of, uh, of um, through the book launches, online readings, uh, things like that, uh, we have, um, I think maybe one way of engaging the readers, uh, or we hope, we hoped like, and this was in the, in the kind of conception of the thing is that by kind of uh, mixing the, the authors, like the different styles of writing that are in this one series, uh, or the different kinds. So you have a, like Ale was mentioning, you have a, um, a kind of more known writer uh, from, from Egypt, for example, with uh, uh, an, an artist who, uh, who people don't know in Egypt. So, so the reader is then has in, one, in this one series, uh, these different kinds of writings, different levels of, 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 uh, of fame or whatever. So it's, we were think we we thought that this would create a different readership, right? Uh, in in kind of pl placing these different genres of of writing in the same in the same series, and that are also um, all uh, kind of uh, priced similarly. So you don't have like the famous writer books are like you know different than the less famous one. But yeah, I don't think I can also yeah I can also say. So a few things. First of all, that we chose that the uh, size of the, um, not just the size, the price of the book is you know, as low as possible that we can afford so that it's also like, you know, the people pick up the book faster. 
and they also can gift it and they can also you know keep copies of it and so on and uh, we also there was also the like the open call to like we did several open calls to have like you know people send us you know their own experiments of um, of uh, self made publications or noise bin books or um, things of this sort and uh, there was another thing that I remembered but now I forgot but because I haven't spoken about the song but I also thought uh, when we are commissioning the song is that uh, there is some sort of rigidity you know when we are translating or when we are writing our introduction or or you know text about Kaifata especially when we are translating this into Arabic or something you know that maybe puts people off or make it sound a little bit, uh, you know, some people off, but or make it sound a little bit like rigid or a little bit like, what is this project about? And so like we thought that we, when we are mixing also this, uh, when we are commissioning a song, maybe there's a way to, for people to memorize, you know, uh, how we speak about Kaifata and what Kaifata research is about. And so this becomes like something that is memorizable and, you know, uh, and uh, so it comes across or it kind of engages better, fa fa faster or engages far more, more people or engages them in a different way than, you know, reading the text right away. So these were, yeah, and we did a lot of workshops as well, like for, for instance, like one of our books with uh, Natasha Sodra Hagigian, it was about the string figure. So we did a couple of workshops on that. And, and oh yeah, now I remember this, the last point. Um, there are so many people who had reached out to us be because they wanted to, you know, uh, use um, the text to design a new book or to do design a new cover for the book or to use the text in a sound work or to use the text in a workshop or to build a, 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 a theater piece or a small theater piece on one of the texts. So the texts or the books have, uh, or parts of the text of the books have, you know, morphed into so many other uh, shapes and possibilities other than the printed format or the kaifata format uh, already. I mean, it has gone out in so many other uh, formats uh, through the interventions of the of their readership of the readership. Um, Maybe I play the song now. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I went, okay, okay, fine. Uh, well, the thing is, there's just one more question uh, in relationship to readership. That's why I. And then we'll play. That's it. That's the only last question, and then we'll play the song. Uh, so what is your opinion on the current state and future of art book fairs in the Arab world, and what can these formats of distribution bring to the conversation? Art book fairs are great. I mean, book fairs are great, and art book fairs are also great uh they i mean the focal point has been really very very successful in Sharjah. uh they held it over three days almost three days and i think most of the publications get sold on the first day imagine the type of income that comes to all these uh to all these like independent publishers or like small you know people who have printed their own books you know at home and homebound and everything home, yeah they yeah so it there was there's a lot of interesting uh, space there for uh, not just like reading interesting content, uh, con uh, content and also like learning more about practices, but also for supporting them. And uh, so many times people have written to us uh, ahead of time uh, to ask us if our books are going to already be at a focal point and had asked like to buy five or six or ten of each title. So uh, because they are, they know they're coming to, you know, stock and take back to their own bookshops. So it's uh, it's probably a good place for um, also like establishing some sort of a uh, distribution network or so. Um, so yeah, I think the book fairs or the art book fairs are are very good. Although the book fairs themselves have uh, are suspected, or some people say that they have killed the distribution networks because like uh, across any uh, that could be that could have been established uh, between the Arab countries because you know just like people travel for the book fair and they sell and they stock and the other book so bookstores stock and that's it. So distribution networks are not so effective because of this possibility that happens once a year. But I don't think there's enough, anyways, the book uh, art book fairs to uh, for a network to be, you know, uh, affected, anyways, by this. Or perhaps I think it's going to be born from that, 
And one thing that we have already experimented uh, in, uh, where Kaifata has experimented with is basically we, uh, Kaifata and Barakunan, which is like a, a group or a collective, uh, a publishing collective from uh, Beirut and Berlin that have, uh, we have uh, featured in the three shows and also in some of our online uh, projects. Um, together we found, uh, you know, very, uh, like we, there's like so much in common and also like in terms of interest. Uh, and so we sat together and we thought, how do we like create um, some sort of a network, a distribution network, even if it starts as a newsletter. And so we co-founded um, a newsletter called Shiluputo, which translates as uh, uh, into a, a, a turtle uh, in Akkadian. And uh, it was also like we reached out to the people that we have invited throughout, uh, you know, the three editions of Kaifa Tavin and its symposium and invited them to contribute their news and latest news and, uh, and latest uh, publications or releases uh, so that we include it in this, um, in this uh, newsletter. And so far we have issued one, one issue only of Shiliputu. But we hope to, yeah, this is like an open call to all publishers to do, to share with us, uh, uh, yeah, their, their, their news, because we could also, like, we could, we thought that through this network, we can uh, build uh, stronger and faster connections between the independent publishers from all across the world, and then easily uh, somehow log into, you know, each other's, like, um, uh, access to venues, to bookstores, to book fairs, and so on. Thank you uh, so much for answering all of these questions. Uh, um, and I, I think um, uh, I, I should hand this over to Hannah and Dan. Uh, we're, we're, we're past time. But um, I know that uh, Ella wanted to share the song as well. Do we have time for that or we I'm, don't? I'm, I'm quite happy to for all the people who have stuck around, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. And I want to hear it too. <laughs> Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> Thank you. So the text of this song is taken from uh, Kefeta text that is in the How to Maneuver publication. زينات مجلات مطويات طائرات ورقيات مغلفات مرسومات كتب كتيبات مؤلف مؤلفات طابعات ناشر ناشرات وكثير من النشرات الممنوعات أو المهمشات أو غير المعروفات الموضوعات المنبوذات المحظورات الذاتيات المخلقات اللغات المفرطات أو حتى المتخشفات الطبعات غير المربحات المنتهيات من السوق ملفيات من الطبع نافذات تلك المبهمات المدفوعات للعمل خلف المظلات العنيدات كيف تات كيف تات كيف تات كيف تات كيف تأية مبادرات النشر المستقلة الرؤى المرفوضة أو الأعمال غير الحاضرات تلك التي أخصيت من الفضاءات العامات أو الراغبات في المشاركات بشروط مختلفات البحث مستمر حول الممارسات النشريات المميزات غير المستقرات أو غير المعروفات المسائلات للحدود والإبداعيات والمهنيات والسياسات النضالات الواسعات لتوسيع رخعة الممكنات واكتشاف مواطن القوة والهشاشات الهائلات لبعض المقترحات المدنية الأكثر إبداعات لدى أنظمة النشر المقيدات that was amazing. I'm glad. I'm glad you played it. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs>